the button. <laughs> oh, <that one. laughs> hey, we're live. Good morning. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us here at uh, YNAS live stream online, Facebook and YouTube. Right off the bat, let me remind you that if we have issues on one platform, you're more than welcome to switch to the other. That's always a that, that's always an option. It's probably a good thing if, if it's if it's buffering a bunch on YouTube, jump over to the Facebook page, um, and you can you can view it there as well. Ah, we're gonna give it a few minutes for people to sign on here, and I see people already on YouTube here that are jumping over to the Facebook page. It looks like <laughs> so. Hey, I, I I hope it's working on both, but uh, and we're gonna give it a shot on both. But last week we had some issues with YouTube, so this week. Um, we're again on both platforms, but I want to remind you of a few things. One is I want to say thank you for being intentional about being the church. I keep hearing stories about people that are reaching out to others and um, ministering to each other during this time. And so thank you for being intentional in that. Keep doing it. Keep reaching out. Keep uh, meeting the needs of those around you. And if you hear of something that um, a need that needs to be met that you can't meet personally, um, contact us here at the church and we'll see what we can do to help out in those situations as well. Um, also, I want to remind you that we have Zoom gatherings um, for both, well, for, for almost everybody right now. We've got a, a men's group and a women's group, group, both on Wednesday nights. If you want to be a part of the men's group, uh, contact me and we'll get you signed up for that. If you want to be a part of the women's group, talk to Colleen um, and she'll get you signed up for that or email the office and we'll make sure that you get in contact with Colleen um, to get hooked up with that Wednesday women's Zoom gathering. Um, Zoom is just an online video chat session where you can get multi multiple people on online at once where you can see each other and talk with each other. So um, we have kids, Zoom for kids on Friday evenings for the younger kids and on Saturday mornings for the older kids. And then for our teens, there's a Zoom gathering on uh, Wednesday afternoons, Wednesday evenings, 5.30, I think, 5 or 5.30. But if you want to be a part of any of those, let us know in the church office and we'll make sure that you get the information to get signed up for those Zoom gatherings that we're, that we're having. Um, and then we have our Thursday night live um, Facebook devotionals on our Facebook, on our Facebook live stream. And so if you want to be a part of just sign on to that Facebook page. We've been having a great time um, with those studies on, on Thursday nights. Thank you for being faithful in your giving. Please continue. Um, I, I know it's a little different during this time, but um, you guys have been very faithful and we've been able to stay up to, but up to date on all of our responsibilities, but we want to be able to continue to do that. So thank you for being faithful in that. You can continue to give online through ynas.com, or you can 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 give through the mail as well. So um, we really appreciate that. Um, please continue to be faithful in that. Then don't forget, at the end of today's message, we're going to be sharing in communion together. Um, so please have those elements of communion ready. Have some bread or a cracker. Um, have some juice ready. For, for you and for your whole family so that we can come together as the church. Even though we're in different places, we can come together as the body of Christ and receive communion together. So I encourage you to have those things ready. If you do have it ready, take a picture and post it with um, YNAS Church at Home. Post it on Facebook or on Instagram, YNAS Church at Home, hashtag YNAS Church at Home. So that, we can, so that we can see that we're sharing in that together. Part of communion is coming together around the table. And so it would be fun to see that. And then um, just a heads up, we most likely will be worshiping this way for another month or so. Um, month and a half, probably till the first couple weeks of, of June. And so um, – Keep that in mind. We don't know for sure. Things are changing all the time with all this stuff. So we really don't know how long this is going to last for us. Um, but be sensitive to that. Be listening for that. One thing we would like to do uh, between now and when we can worship together again in the sanctuary is we want to have another drive-in worship gathering. And so I'm excited. Um, I'm looking at most likely it'll be uh, Memorial Day weekend. 
um, May 24th, that Sunday, that we'll be gathering together out here in the parking lot and just celebrating together the message and worship and just a, a, a time for us to stay in our cars or on our cars, but to come together and worship. And so I want to encourage you to mark that down. Um, that'll be most likely when that's happening, but be listening for that. And let's see. Anything else before we invite Cassie to come? Hey, one thing that I'm missing that we haven't been able to do as well during this time is pray for each other. So I want to encourage you. You know, typically we have, well, I've got a stack of them here on the desk that have, have been filled out. But we, we have these prayer cards that we pass out with our bulletins every Sunday morning that you're able to communicate with us your prayer requests. Well, since we can't do that, um, I want to encourage you, if you have something that we need to be praying for, email it to the church, um, ynaz at sbcglobal.net, ynaz at sbcglobal.net, and we'll, we'll make sure that we're praying for those things. Um, just send us that email, um, or we still have our prayer chain that's very active these days, and so you can contact Jesse Ferris or contact the church office with those prayer requests. If you want it to be on the prayer chain, um, indicate that. Um, otherwise, um, I'll be praying for it, and, and I'll be sharing it with some of those around me that I know are um, prayer warriors. And so please be praying for those things, or be, be aware of that, that you have that opportunity as well. And then I, I know that there are some of you that are new to us through this live stream that haven't visited us here at the church in person. We would love to be able to stay in contact with you. We would love to be able to email you um, our email updates and just stay in that, stay in touch with you. And so if you would like to share your contact information with us, that email address is a great place to send that. If you want to email us, again, ynaz at sbcglobal.net. We will make sure that you get on our email list so that you're getting our updates and we can um, we can stay in contact with you that way. And so um, if you're new with us, shoot us that email and, and get in. Um, get connected with us. We would really appreciate that. Um, good. I also want to remind you that um, the more you interact with us on social media, the more people see it. So like these videos, hit that little thumbs up, hit that heart, do something to show that you like it. That way more people see it. Um, if you're willing to share it, share it on Facebook, share it on, on Instagram, send that link. Um, the more that you interact with what we're doing, the more people see it, which means more people are hearing the word of God. Today's message is about God's incredible grace. It would be a powerful message for people to hear in today's culture, in today's world. And so I encourage you to share it. And I don't, there's even watch parties that you can host where people are watching with you and you can talk back and forth in the comments as you watch on Facebook. Um, but I encourage you to be a part of that. Join us in that. All right. Hey, let's pray together. And then I'm going to invite Cassie to lead us in worship. And then after, after we sing a few songs, I want to share with you some of the things that we um, experienced this last Friday at our district assembly. They, they call it the reunion, but it was an online gathering of the Church of the Nazarene all across the district, um, the Sacramento district. And so I'm going to share with you some of the highlights from that um, after we worship together as well. Pray with me. Father, thank you for inviting us into your presence. And Lord, we know that your presence is bigger than a building. That as we gather in our homes across this town and around, really around the world today, that your presence is right here with us in your church, in your body. What a powerful picture that is. Lord, as we worship today, I pray that we would be able to set aside our worries and fears. That we would be able to set aside the distractions. And that we would be able to set our hearts on you. That we would listen for your spirit and allow your spirit to speak to us and shape us. That we would be engaged with you that we would receive what you have for us this morning, your touch, that you would refresh us and renew us and revive us. Thank you, Lord, for what you want to do in us today. We're so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Good morning. This morning, um, as we enter into this time of worship, um, the first, I'll just say the first couple songs in case you don't have the lyrics, but um, we're doing Your Grace is Enough and Forever. And I just challenge you to, like every week um, that we've talked about, but just to sing and sing boldly. Um, God's presence is in your home and in the midst of wherever you are worshiping today. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. reminded of the fact that sometimes it's difficult to sing of God's faithfulness in seasons where we may not see it in front of us, where we feel like God is distant or feel um, isolated from others. And yet it's still such a powerful thing to be able to sing that over the situation uh, and be able to see God's faithfulness in the midst of it and know that because God has been faithful before, that God will continue to be faithful. Forever, for the light 
this morning. Let that be the cry of our hearts, God, that as we put our trust in you, Lord, as we learn how to trust you more, that our lives would be a reflection of you, God, and that the ways that you love, that we would love others, God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. Hey, well, good morning again. Um, looks like well, there's still 19 viewers on our YouTube channel, and so maybe it's still working. Um, I did get a text message that it wasn't working well. So again, if you want to switch over to our Facebook feed, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, it may be a better feed, but if you if it's working well for you, stay right where you're at, and we'll make sure that or uh, we'll do our best to keep it going. Hey, I want to again, remind you that one of the most powerful things you can do is share this, share it with your friends and, and neighbors and your, your social media contacts so that more people are hearing about the grace of God. Hey, I was going to share a few highlights with you from our district assembly. Every, every year, churches from all over our district, so Sacramento district, from Sacramento area up to us, from uh, like Sparks, Fallon, Nevada, all the way over to Vacaville, big area, 62, 63 different congregations um, gather together for, for, a, for an annual meeting. And at that meeting this year, it was online, of course, but at that gathering this year, uh, one of the one of the, my favorite things that happened was they or we um, voted to reelect to renominate reelect uh, Steve Scott, our district superintendent, to serve for another four years. And so that was a, a highlight for me. Steve's a great guy, and it's an exciting thing to have him in leadership over our whole district. So that's that's a neat thing. Another thing that happened is our district missionary president, uh, Joanne Sturgeon, retired, and we nominated Dan Hopkins as the new district missions president. He's a pastor down in Lodi. He 
served for eight years on the mission field in Dominica in the Caribbean. Um, he was a missionary and a district superintendent there. Quality guy to be serving as our district missionary president for the next for the next several years. And so um, that's another exciting thing. Hey, one, one thing that I'm super excited about is I was elected um, as our as one of the Sunday school um, and discipleship ministries representatives for our district to go back to the General Assembly next summer, um, a year away. But the General Assembly happens every four years and all the Nazarene churches from all over the world gather together for, for, an, uh, for a, a meeting that happens every four years. And so I was nominated, elected as one of our representatives for the Sunday School and Discipleship Ministries um, gathering there. So that's pretty cool. Um, I'll get to travel back there in um, in 2021. And then a few things that were exciting to me and that made me really proud about you, about our church. One um, is that we were awarded a Missions Priority One Award. And this is for keeping missions a priority in the church um, with our kids, with our teens to keep missions in front of the church. And so we received an award for that. So Nisha is our local, Nisha Harriman's our local uh, missions president. And she, with all the work that she's done and things that you're doing, we were able to receive that award this year. And we also won or received um, recognition as a church of excellence in the area of, of world evangelism. This is an award for supporting the World Evangelism Fund. Um, churches that give um, at least five point, I believe it's, what is it? 5.7% of their income towards world evangelism through the World Evangelism Fund receive that recognition. And so that was also a super neat thing for us to be able to do. That's through Alabaster offering and deputation offerings for missionaries and other um, approved giving. That's that's through that. And so thank you for your faithfulness in that this last year. What, a, what an honor that is. Um, and then we received recognition as a discipleship honor school for growth in discipleship ministries within our church. And we received recognition as a good Samaritan church. Um, and that 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 has to do with the ministries that we have as a church. So our food pantry is a big part of that. Um, Bob and Jesse Ferris head up our food pantry ministry. And um, because that's an ongoing ministry, that's part of why we received that award, along with the other things we do to actively minister in this community. So thank you for all your faithfulness in what you're doing. Um, it's super neat to see that. And not everybody receives those rewards. In fact, out of 63 active congregations on our district, only 18 churches on our district showed growth in worship attendance. That, that's kind of sad to me. Um, only 18 churches out of 63 showed growth in worship attendance. That, that's a sign of the times. It's what's happening across our nation in churches. But on our own district, I, I thought it would be better than that. But our church was one of those 18. I'm so, so proud of that because that means more people in our community are hearing about the love and the grace of Jesus, the hope in him. Um, our, our church here in Wairika, last year we averaged 136 in worship attendance. This last year, we averaged 157. We, we grew in average worship attendance by 21 people. That's an increase of 15%. That, that's amazing. You guys are amazing inviting your friends and, and sharing the good news of Jesus. Um, so. I'm super proud of that. That's what it's about. People hearing about the hope of Christ. So thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for being faithful in your giving. Thank you for being faithful in your in your witness. Um, we couldn't, we're not the church without you. So thank you for being a part of that. <clears throat> the end of last year, I did something that I haven't done in, in, in several years. Um, things were ramping up in my schedule. It was filling up quickly. I wanted to attempt to be a bit more organized this year to plan things out a bit. So I purchased, <laughs> I purchased this. It's it, it, it's a planner. It's got a weekly plan, and it's got a, a monthly plan where I can log everything out. I can I can plan it all out. Um, 
I set a reminder on my phone that at the beginning of every week, I would sit down and, and, and map out my week. So I knew what was coming so I could be productive in what I was doing. And now, <laughs> every Monday when that reminder goes off, I'm reminded of how big a waste this investment was. Because <laughs> everything's changed. I have more crossouts in the last month than I have things that were added. Everything is it has changed. All, all the basketball tournaments and practices have been canceled. All the meetings, all the events have been canceled. And I feel like this virus, <laughs> and I promise I'm not going to talk about this a whole lot today, okay? I want to stay, I'm trying to stay positive in my outlook on things. I, I want to be a person of joy and not a person that brings things down. But I feel like this virus is kind of, in, in a lot of ways, put our daily lives on hold. Like good things were happening and we were beginning to move in the right direction and we were making big plans for summer and boom, everything comes to a stop. The virus comes in and interrupts everything we had planned. In today's scripture, we're going to read a story about a man who had big plans for Jesus. His daughter was sick and she was dying and his plan was to grab Jesus and, and bring Jesus to his daughter as soon as possible so that Jesus could heal this man's daughter. But on the way, on the way to, to heal the daughter, they were sidetracked and the man's daughter died. I was intrigued and encouraged this week by Jesus' words to the man when they heard that this little girl had died. Jesus said this. He said, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. The ESV says, only believe. Jesus is really saying, don't fear. Keep on believing. He's saying, I'm still right here in the midst of this interruption. I'm still in control. He's saying, don't let your trust in me wane. Don't let it fade. Friends, I don't want you to miss that today. When tragedy interrupts life, when it looks like there's no hope, don't fear. Jesus is right here here. Keep on believing. Faith endures through hopelessness. Keep your head up. Keep your eyes up. Let's be people of hope. Okay. <laughs> Turn with me to Mark chapter five this morning. Mark chapter five. We're going to be looking at verse 21. I'm going to give you a second to get there. I know. Um, well, we've been in Mark for a while now, but for some of you, um, yeah, just grab your Bible. Turn to Mark chapter 5, verse 21. All right. <clears throat> Let's read this story. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat, again crossed over, because remember he went across, last week we talked about him going across the lake. Um, two weeks ago, he defeated the storm as he went across the lake. And then he got to the other side of the lake and he healed, uh, he delivered the man that had been possessed by a legion of demons, over 2,000 demons. He delivered him, set him free. Um, so now, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because, of, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt, she felt, her, she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering at once. Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding, you, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you could ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, she told him the truth. 
he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, uh, came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter's dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, to Letha Combe, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Wow. You know, strict orders not to tell anyone about this, not to let anyone know about this. Before, over on the other side of the lake in Gentile land, he said, feel free to share this. Go and go and tell. He told the man that it was delivered, go and tell your friends and family. Um, over on the other side of the lake in Gentile land, he wasn't scared or he wasn't worried that it was going to cause an uprising or cause a revolt. Here, back in Jewish territory, where the Jewish leaders were beginning to see what happened and feel threatened by him, he's saying, don't tell. It's not time yet. It's not time for my crucifixion. It's not time for me to die yet. Don't tell yet. Interesting to see the contrast there. You know, that story, I I've read those stories before many times. I I've heard those stories preached about many. I've preached on those stories myself. But I only really remember those two stories being preached separately. I don't remember ever hearing those two stories preached together. But I think those two stories literally being sandwiched together one inside the other, I think it's very intentional. I think they're supposed to be taken together on purpose for a few reasons. One is what we had already talked about a little bit. The things we see as dead ends, the things we see as interruptions in life, Jesus doesn't see them that way. Jesus sees them as opportunities for God to display his power and for us to grow in our faith. And we talked about that a little bit, but don't fear. Keep on believing. Just like he was saying to Jairus, you believed enough to seek me out. Keep on believing. I'm going to see you through this. Jesus is faithful throughout those interruptions. Jesus sees them coming. It's a powerful thought. I love that. I also love, and this is what we're going to focus mostly today, but I also love the contrast between the two different people that are seeking Jesus for a miracle. The, I love that, that contrast. Let, let's first take a look at Jairus. What do we know about him? What do we know about Jairus? Well, he was a synagogue leader. He, he wasn't a priest, but he was most likely a Pharisee. He, he was most likely a Jew who held strictly to the Jewish law. And as a synagogue leader, he would have been one to organize events in the local synagogue and enforce the Jewish laws on those that were coming to the synagogue. The synagogue was different than the temple. The temple was, was in Jerusalem where the high priest was and the Holy of Holies and where they made a pilgrimage every year to make sacrifice. But the synagogue was a local community's place of worship. And, and the local community would go there for learning. And to, to hear from the, from the teachers there at the synagogue. So Jairus had this position of power within their local community. We also know that, that, that Jairus had some money. N not, from, not only from the position he held, but from the size of his household. We know that he, he, he had some wealth. Um, and we know that from... The commotion that went on when his daughter passed away. All the people that had gathered. And, and you notice it, it mentions with wailing. Um, Matthew talks about flutes playing. As you look at that a little bit, and I'm not going to spend long here. But that is, at those times, those that had money invested in professional mourners. 
to come and mourn the death of whoever it was in the household, if they, if they could afford it. And so these things were a sign of the fact that Jairus was a man of wealth. Um, so this rich and powerful man approached Jesus. He, he was able to walk right up to him and fall, his, fall at his feet. And not only that, and this hit me hard this week, not only that, Jairus had a name. As you read through the Gospel of Mark, there, there are not a lot of people that have names other than the disciples and Jairus and a few others. Jairus had a name. I mention that because the woman that we talk about in this same story, in the same scripture, was nameless. Nobody knows what her name was. She had been bleeding for 12 years, which means that she had been unclean for 12 years. That means she was treated like a leper, like an outcast. N nobody would go near her or come in contact with her unless they themselves were made unclean. She was poor. She hadn't, she had, she'd spent all her money on doctors and on, on, on healing, trying to heal this, this, this bleeding that she had. She was nameless. Nobody cared. Jairus, Jairus was a Jew, practicing and enforcing Jewish law. This woman wasn't even allowed to bring her sacrifice to the priest because she was unclean. And there was nothing she could do about it. Unlike Jairus, she couldn't even approach Jesus and fall at his feet. This woman risked her very life to sneak in, to weasel her way through the crowd. I wonder how many people became unclean as she made her way through the crowd. Trying to get close enough to Jesus to just touch the fringe of his garment. If I can just touch his clothes. Power and wealth and a name. This woman had a disease, was unclean, was poor, was a woman. And Jesus... Jesus was on a mission for this rich, powerful religious leader. He was going to heal this powerful man's daughter, and he was interrupted. Who touched me? The disciples, they almost laughed at him. There were so many people crowding in from all sides. They said, what do you mean who touched you? Jairus, the religious leader, I imagine was growing frustrated and anxious because his daughter was dying this very minute. Every minute they took out of, out of the, the mission was a minute against his daughter's life. And this woman, trembling with fear after touching Jesus and being healed, came and fell at Jesus' feet. Trembling with fear. What, what was she afraid of? Well, she knew she knew that by touching Jesus, she had been healed. She had been hoping to just slip in and touch him and slip away unnoticed. But now Jesus was calling her out. In the midst of the crowd, Jesus was calling her out. She was afraid because of his power. Because in one sense, she had taken his power without his permission. She, she could have been afraid because of Jairus, the, the religious leader, the religious leader who very well could have turned her away from the synagogue because she was unclean. Um, and now she's here interrupting his miracle. Um, and she could have been afraid because, most likely, because she was entering the crowd unannounced. She wasn't calling out unclean, warning people of her presence. And so many people had been touched and made unclean themselves, even Jesus. My guess is that one of her biggest fears was the crowd. And now she had been called out. Everyone she touched would have had, had to go through a cleansing ritual. She had, she had so many reasons to be afraid. But for her, her desperate need for healing and, and her incredible faith that Jesus could heal her, overcame her fear. She fell at Jesus' feet, fully prepared for Jesus' reprimand. And Jesus' response, his response was, daughter, 
Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Your faith has healed you. Even though you're unclean and poor and outcast. To say nothing of the fact that you're a woman in the midst of a man-dominated society. Your faith has healed you. Even though it was a last resort type of faith. She had already gone to the doctors and spent everything she had. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed of your suffering. Not only has your bleeding stopped, but now you can return to your normal life, to your family that you haven't been able to be around for 12 years. You can go to the temple again and offer sacrifices. You can move freely among the people. Your faith has healed you. Be free. And I think even more importantly than that, Jesus called her daughter. He called her daughter. When society had made her an outcast and rejected her, Jesus saw her. He saw past all the labels that society had given her, and he loved her, and he received her as daughter. Church, that's powerful. How often do we reject those that we deem unclean without giving them that second chance or that chance? Or that fourth chance. That, that's how. That's not how Jesus did it. Jesus didn't label people and reject them. He received them and delivered them. Your faith has healed you. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free. In the meantime, Jairus is stewing. This was supposed to be my miracle. She's invading on my time. Why would Jesus stop to help this woman? And then he hears that it's too late, that his daughter is already dead. Can you imagine what Jairus is feeling? Only, if, if only. <laughs> and Jesus, overhearing what was being said, replies, don't be afraid, just believe. Jairus is thinking 30 minutes ago, or, or Jesus is thinking, 30 minutes ago, you fell at my feet believing I could heal your daughter. What's changed? Well, death. Death is changed. Death is final. <laughs> or is it? Don't be afraid. Just believe. Jesus arrives at Jairus' house where the professional mourners and the crowds laugh at him. There's no reason for you to be here. You're too late. She's already dead. But Jesus sends the crowds away. He takes the girl by the hand. Once again, once again, showing that he's not afraid of the unclean. He takes her by the hand and raises her from the dead. Talitha Kohn, little girl, I say to you, get up. And this young lady with her whole life before her, nearing that age of marriage in their culture, 12 years old, he, she, she gets up and she begins to walk around. Church, I believe right here in Mark's gospel, we're seeing Jesus begin to display his power over death. You see it right there in this scripture that we, we've read. Jesus is saying, not only can I make the unclean clean again, but I have power over death. And he's saying, he's saying that he doesn't limit who that power is for. He doesn't say, oh, you're powerful and rich and of good standing in the community. I'll use my power on you. I'll show you grace. But you, you're, you're dirty and poor and an outcast. I'm not wasting my time with you. He doesn't say that. He doesn't go there. Those words he spoke to the little girl, get up. The rich, powerful rules daughter, get up. It's really the same thing he's saying to the unclean, outcast woman. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Friends, whether you identify more with the religious ruler or the unclean woman, Jesus' touch is for you. His touch is for you. Whether you just need a refilling of his peace and refreshing of your spirit, or if you need complete healing and deliverance, his touch is for you. 
In a few moments here, we're going to receive communion together. Come to the table of remembrance, remembering all that Jesus has done for us, all of us. Remembering the fact that he suffered and he died. Not only for his followers, but for the man that nailed him to the cross as well. Remembering that one day, maybe even soon, one day, Jesus is going to return for for all of us who have surrendered to him, who have put our faith in him, who trust in him. In a moment, we're going to receive the bread and the juice that represent his body and his blood together as the church. But before before we do that, you humble yourself and pray with me. Let's pray together. Father, today we've been reminded of who you are. We've been reminded of your power to save. We've been reminded of your love for the least of these. To save a wretch like me. Father, today we come to your feet just as Jairus did. Just as the woman did. Desperate for you. Lord, we need your touch. We need to hear your voice speaking to us. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. Lord, we need to be reassured not to be afraid, but to keep believing. We trust that you're God. We trust that you're still in control. Lord, help us not to live in fear, but strengthen our faith. We love you. Right now, Father, we're so grateful for these elements of communion that unite us around your table. These elements that remind us that you love us and that you died for us and that you defended death and hell on our behalf. Thank you, Jesus, for that sacrifice. Today, as we receive these elements together, we declare our, our faith in you. We truly do love you, Father. And, and all of this is prayed in the name of Jesus, who makes us clean. Amen. Church, I'm going to invite you to pass out the bread this morning, wherever you are there in your house. Take the bread. Receive the bread this morning as his body that has been broken for you. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, take, Aaron, and friends, take the cup. Take the cup this morning. And with a grateful heart, with a humble heart, receive the cup together this morning. Thanking God for his grace and the sacrifice that he made to make us holy. I'm going to invite Cassie to come, and I want you to listen to the words of this song. It's a, it's a powerful song for us today. L- listen to the words as she leads us this morning.
filled with your intention. You don't see the lines we draw between secular and sacred. Show me how to cope with the lies. I don't wanna forget. I hope, I hope you caught the message of that song. <laughs> Life is a gift and the giver is good. In the midst of our mess, life is a gift and the giver is good. Teach me that it all belongs and everything is sacred. That, that, that fact that this creation that we're living in, God's gift to us. And our lives shouldn't be separated between what's holy and what's sacred, what's Sunday morning and what's Monday through the rest of the week. It shouldn't be separated. But when Christ is in our lives, he is in all and over all. As we trust him, as we have faith in him, the ordinary shines and glows filled with your intentions. As we're following after him, you don't see the lines we draw between secular and sacred. Hmm. That's powerful. Life is a gift and the giver is good. Let's pray together this morning. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. Together, as your people, we give you praise today. Thank you for your blessing, for your grace, for your power. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or seek or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and through all generations forever. Amen. Go in his peace today, proclaiming his hope today. Life is a gift. The giver is good. Have a great week. God bless you.